All right, so we're still in 11th grade lit, talking about chapter 30, 31. Um, all right, so uh, number five, after writing the letter to Ms. Watson, Huff racked with indecision. I was a trembling, he says, because I got to decide forever twixt two things, and I noted, what are these two things? It's really the most important line in the whole, the whole book. What is, he, what is he willing to do? He's got to decide, yeah. It's between if he's um, willing to stay at Jim and do the morally right thing versus um, just having him stay turned in, which would be the socially acceptable thing to do. I like the way you put that. The morally right versus the socially acceptable. That's really good. Uh, turning him in was the socially acceptable. But oddly enough, he really thinks that's also the morally right thing to do. He, he, he thinks it is. We understand that that wouldn't be and that he's really doing. So what is he willing to do um, as a result? I don't think I'm asking you this yet. What is he willing to do as a result of tearing the letter up and helping Jim escape? Like, where does he think he's going to end up? So that, that proves that he thinks it's the morally it's not only so it's acceptable, but also he thinks it's the morally wrong thing to help him escape. It would be morally right to help him to escape. And so if you do morally wrong things, you end up in hell, according to this thinking. And, um, and so he says he's willing to go to hell. But that's tremendous. Think about it. at the beginning, he just saw Jim as a slave, and he was nice to him sometimes, but he played tricks on him. Now he's willing to go to hell for it. I'd say that's a friend. Uh, that's the, the highest form of love. You, even Paul said that about the um, uh, the Jews uh, that he was trying to win over. He said, I, I'd be willing to go to hell so they could be saved. It doesn't work that way. Um, but that's that was how much he wanted his people to be saved. Um, we know number six. Number seven, as a result of this moral crisis, does Jim realize the institution of slavery is wrong? Give evidence. Well, we've kind of already answered that. Does he think that's? Does he think that the institution of slavery is wrong? Yeah. yeah. Ironically, no. Uh, remember what Julian said. Well, yeah, we we changed that a little bit because he thinks it's morally wrong to help somebody escape from slavery. So he actually does think slavery. Is and he doesn't have any any principles about this. He doesn't have any. Um, he 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 believes it because it's all he knows. He knows slavery because he's been told it's right, and so he's not. He doesn't know any different. So he just likes this one slave, Jim, and he's willing to to help him. Um, but it's the wrong thing to do. That's why this is so interesting. Does Huff's attitude toward institution of slavery make the decision to help Jim seem more admirable or less? The fact that he thinks he's doing the wrong thing, but he does it anyway. Does, does that make you admire him more? Yeah, me too. Why, Lillian? Because it shows how much he actually loves Jim and that he's willing to do the wrong thing to show him. Right, and it shows you how uneducated he is. He's not intellectually brilliant, but he could have been, maybe if he'd had a better start. So it makes you feel sorry for him that he can't make that connection. Um, but, you know, you, uh, I admire him too, that he, at least in this one situation, he's doing the right thing, doing more than most people would do at the time. They wouldn't help a slave escape. Uh, and then number nine, um, Many readers in the novel regard Huck's struggle with his conscience in, 30, in chapter 31 as the climax of the novel. What earlier episode in which Huck experienced a similar moral conflict regarding Jim foreshadows his final struggle? And I, we already mentioned it. What's the other time where he, he tries to turn him in but simply can't make himself in? I mentioned it earlier. Yeah. Right, and I don't remember what uh, what caused him to want at that point to do that. He just felt like he was doing the wrong thing. But
but he doesn't do it because remember uh, Jim is there saying Huck's the best friend I ever had nobody ever was as good to me as Huck was Huck you're a great guy and he would listen to this as he was headed to turn him in but he didn't tell Jim that Jim didn't know that but he he, uh, he couldn't do it And he says, in what way is this final decision more courageous? It's more courageous because he's willing to go to hell for it. And he, he makes that statement. All right, so we, we've done 30, 31. We've got, again, about 10 more minutes. Um, you read through 35, and I can't remember which of these ends, so I'll have to, I'm not sure exactly where the question stops. Um, Aunt Sally, number one. Um, Brian, do you mind reading that one and get it started? Uh, Aunt Sally, the same as that book, is a visitor who is my husband, and she has been eagerly awaiting. I just have to deal with her mistake. No, he said, he's a complete stranger to him. Never seen her before. And, um, she thinks he is, well, what was the number two? Who? Tom Sawyer. Tom Sawyer. And what does he do with that? Does he tell her the truth? No. Of course not. Um, for, and, and, and what's ironic about the fact he has now become Tom Sawyer? That was a sizzle friend. And he spent a lot of time around Tom Sawyer. Exactly. For the whole book, he wanted to be Tom Sawyer. What would Tom do here? Let's go into the Rex Steamboat, because that's what Tom would do. Um, and so now it's almost like his dream has come true. He is now Tom Sawyer. Number two, when Uncle Sauce returns, Huck learns what his new name is. What is it? We got that. Number three, Huck intercepted the real visitor coming from town. How does Tom react when first seeing Huck? I think I asked you that on the clip. Yeah, do it. Um, he, Tom is shocked because he thought Huck had a guy. Right. Yeah, and he's maybe more than shocked because he thought Huck was dead. And here he is standing right in front of him. Um, how does Tom help Huck out in the predicament of the felt suit? He helps Huck's plan to escape. Yeah, but in terms of, he's, he's Tom Sawyer, yeah, not uh, Huck he, is Tom Sawyer. He agrees to, like, and who was the other person? Uh, someone from the town or something. No, Sid Sawyer. Which is his his uh, yeah. his brother. Very good. Nice job. Right. Um, so he pretends to be the brother, and he's delighted to do it. Line five and six and seven. Um, deal with the, uh, it's chapter, I think it's 33, 32, but it deals, uh, it deals with the, uh, the king and the duke. So they go to town, this is six, seven, and eight, or five, six, seven. Um, what do they find? And I'll deal with that same issue. They actually see the king and the duke. Wow. Well, I mean, not wow, well, but what, what's going on? They're yes. Being tarred with feathers. They are being tarred with feathers. And do you remember how Tom and then number number seven? Do you have do you remember how Huck reacts to it? He's sentimental. Um, why do you say sentimental? Because he has had a lot of chaotic problems with the Duke and Felton and. Bad about all of, about him being tarred with feathers because he doesn't really know how someone can do that to another person. Now, to me, that's not sentimental. As we define uh, sentimental, we're we're saying it's overly emotional. Uh, I think, that is I, really yeah, I think that's an appropriate response to what he. I'm going to read it to you. Um, here come here comes a rushing, a raging rush of people with torches and an awful whooping and yelling and banging and the pimp pimp hands and blowing horns. They're gonna 
they're torturing essentially these two men and they're treating it like a you know a celebration uh, and we jumped to one side to let them go by and as they went by see they had the king and the duke a straddle the rail doesn't take you but a couple of seconds to imagine that's uncomfortable that is I know it was the king and the duke though it was they was tar they were all over tar and feathers and didn't look nothing in the world that was human just looked like a couple of monstrous big soldier plumes well it made me sick to see it and I was sorry for the poor pitiful rascals it seemed like I could ever feel any hardness against them anymore in the world it was a dreadful thing to see human beings can be awful cruel to one another to one another um, is that sentimentality or is that genuine honest sentiment I think so. I mean, we ought to feel that way when we see something like that happening. But how do you explain it? Because he didn't like them. They weren't nice to him. They had basically kidnapped Jim and Huck. They kidnapped their, they took their raft and got him in a lot of trouble. They could have gotten a lot of trouble with the Wilkes's and uh, they, they sold Jim down, the, you know, they sold Jim to the Phelps farm. So they had good reason to be, okay, they got what they deserved. Why doesn't he feel that way? What does that say about Huck? That he didn't feel that way? He's a kind person. He, he's at heart a kind person. He could have enjoyed seeing his enemies hurt, but he doesn't. He, just, he says, I couldn't ever feel any hardness against them in the world. What does that say about Mal? That's one of the questions you were working on yesterday was about um, the the sentimentality. Um, what does this say about Molly? Like, what's wrong with Molly? Even the name is, I don't think there's anything good about that name. If you call something a mob, that's not a good thing. Um, you don't see a mob at church. You know, you don't see the, the mob of people worshiping at church. You know, they, you don't see that. You don't see the mob at a game. Anything that's organized and fairly um, healthy but it's always negative. So what is he saying about, that's not the first time we've seen a mob. Where have you seen mobs in the book? Sherbert. Sherbert and Bart, they tried to lynch him. It didn't work, but there was a mob. So what's he saying about mob? What's kind of Huck Finn, I'm sorry, Mark Twain's attitude toward mob? And why are they always bad? Mobs never do good things. Uh, a mob of people helped a little old lady cross the street. A mob of people prevented a robbery. A mob of people helped somebody build their house. You never use that term. So what's inherently wrong with mobs? They cause damage. And what's the reason that they're, they are, or, or what's the reason for a mob? I and mean, how do you create a mob? Would you join the mob? We're gonna have a mob here tonight. I mean, that's silly. You don't, you don't plan it, right? You don't usually plan a mob to get together. Um, so what, what's the thing that the mental attitude of people involved in something like that? It's the ultimate peer pressure. It's the ultimate go along with the crowd. It, and people don't think. They just do. It, they, they get all inflamed about something and, and um, um, they, they just, they usually, because they're not thinking, it usually turns out badly. So that would be a great question for my test is think of the times when my, think about the mob at the camp meeting. Now they weren't a mob, they were respectable people, but they were guilty of sentimentalism because they let this guy um, take advantage of them. So people in mobs don't think clearly, they just follow the crowd and all of a sudden something bad's happened. We didn't plan it, you know, we didn't mean to do that, it just things got out of hand. Um, so I think that we've, we've talked about, I don't remember, personally why he wanted to go down there in the first place because and I could look it up. Anybody remember? So I really we really haven't answered five. Um, I can go back and check that. But we did answer six and seven. All right. When Huck tells number eight, when Huck tells Tom he intends to set Jim free, how does Tom respond? And Huck is number nine, Huck is distressed by Tom's response. Wow. I think we've already said it, haven't we? 
Tom helps her free Jim. He says, I'll be happy to help you. Why does that bother her? And I don't know if he asked him or not, but he, he volunteered. Because yeah. uh, it's, it's against what they're supposed to what they're supposed to think. So he's just kind of like confused <laughs> whenever he agrees. If it's bad for her to free a, a, a black man, a slave, from slavery, if, if it's bad for Huck, it's equally bad for Tom. And it's, as uh, Julian said, socially unacceptable. And, and so here's his best friend doing something that's socially unacceptable that Huck doesn't like, but he's doing it because he likes Jim. But what's Tom's motive? And so he looks down on him. It's kind of ironic that, again, Tom's actually doing the right thing, um, but Huck doesn't think it's the right thing. And I ask you this at the end of the quiz. I know you, you, what is Huck's plan for freeing Jim and compare that to Tom's plan for freeing Jim? What was Huck's plan for freeing Jim? Yes. Uh, just get the chain off of wherever it's attached to and get out. Yeah, get the key, unlock the door, open the door, and leave. That's a pretty simple plan. Just get the key, unlock the door, and leave. But Tom complains it's too simple. He says when Huck hears Tom's plan, he says, I see in a minute it was worth 15 of mine, mine for style. Throughout the novel, Huck refers admiringly to Tom Sawyer's style. What does Huck mean by style? And in the next question, Tom's plan to free is enormously complicated and troublesome. What causes the complications and troubles? And number 13, uh, what are some of the complications, romantic bits of style? So we're granted, we'll finish with this. 11, 12, 13. What is Tom's plan? Yes. To somehow get in the building. I can't remember that part, but then saw off the chain <laughs> rather than just take it off the bed frame and then dig their way out with knives like underneath. Right. And it's just the one, it's on the ground floor, but he has to have a rope ladder. And where is he getting these ideas? Books. And so it's similar to uh, the Grangerfords and the Shepherdsons. Now, why are, we, why are we fighting the Shepherdsons? We don't know. It's just what we've always done. So Tom's answer is the same. Why are we, make, why are we doing it this way, Tom? If Huck asks, why are we going to all this much trouble? All we have to do is open the door. And he said, because that's the way it's done. I read it in the book. You just you can't just do that. That's too simple. It's gotta be complicated. What's one reason for the complication? Like what's one motivation to do the complicated hard thing as opposed to the easy thing? Like you get yeah. Maybe because it's a cooler story. So. It's more drama. I mean, he's all about the drama and the the glory. If we do it the hard way, we get bored. If we do it the easy way, which is the practical way, there's, there's no credit for that. And so let's do it the hard way. And of course, this whole section in the book is just is um, satire. I mean, it's just absurd. Um, well, what does he mean by style? Tom does things with style, which means he makes them complicated and dangerous. So, but what is style? Well, just to quick at this, it means drama and glory. He, he does things that are more dramatic, more exciting, as you said, and offer a chance for glory as opposed to just the simple, complicated thing. And that's number 12. What causes the complications is that he gets them from books and they're totally inapplicable. You don't need a rope ladder when you're on the ground floor. Um, you know, later, I don't know if you, I don't think you've read this, but later, they actually get spiders and snakes and put them in, in, in the room because if you were a real prisoner in these books, that you'd have spiders and snakes in your room. Uh, and he says he's gonna actually not only cut the chain off, but we gotta cut his leg off too. And then one time, uh, he says, 
you know, it took so and so in this book 37 years to escape. And Tom says, 37 years, yeah, I guess that's not practical. We can't wait 37 years to free Jim, so let's pretend that it's 37 years. Well, the funny thing about that, the whole thing is pretend. They're pretending everything. But Tom does make the excuse or the concession that we can't wait 37 years to, you know, to free him. And what makes that funny is he says, okay, we could, we could will, will Jim to our son and our grandson. So everybody who, who's in our family could spend their entire life trying to get Jim to escape. When all you have to do is steal the key, and by the way, 37 years from now, most of these people are gonna be dead. It's just, it's just absurd, and that's the point. It's just a game, an absurd game, um, that Tom is playing, and Mark Twain's making fun of that. It's, it's ridiculous. So, good job with that. I, I, tomorrow, we're gonna. I'm asking you to do those five questions, and we'll we'll talk about. I'll give you credit for that, and um, I'm gonna ask you to read the book for next Thursday.